Are you a beginner looking to set up testing with RSpec for your Ruby on Rails application? Then stick around to find out how. I'm Thomas, and this is Bear with BrainTrust Digital. We're full stack developers obsessed with learning. If you're interested in learning about full stack web development, please consider subscribing below. Also, if you have a friend who you think may be interested in this type of content and you'd be willing to share, we'd really appreciate that. In this AWS Rails tutorial, we're gonna walk through how to set up RSpec in your Ruby on Rails application. Up to this point, our features have been a bit scary in that we have no safety net. Adding tests with RSpec will allow us to validate our code. We can also ensure we don't unintentionally break things in the future when adding features. I'm not gonna go full test-driven development in all of my future tutorials, but I do wanna add some more content around testing. I think this is an area that isn't covered as much as it should be, and I think I could add some value here. So with that being said, let's get into the tutorial to learn how to add RSpec into your Ruby on Rails application. The first thing we're gonna do is switch to our browser and navigate to rubygems.org. Here you can enter RSpec Rails and hit search. This first option here, rspec-rails 4.0.2, is the latest release at time of recording. So we're going to go ahead and click that now. Then you can click the copy link for the gem file. Instead, we're going to go through to the home page and check the installation instructions. Here on GitHub, we can see the rspec rails gem repository. If we scroll down, we can see this first section here of installation instructions. It looks like you have two options here. In our case, we're gonna use this first option here just to get the latest stable release. Please note that this gem is grouped by development and test, so this gem will not be installed in your production environment. This is part of why I came to this page to grab the installation instructions, as opposed to just copying the gem from RubyGems. If we flip back over to Sublime Text and then open our gem file, we're gonna scroll down and paste our code. Since we already have a development and test block, we're just gonna move this up and then delete the additional grouping. Now we can flip back over to the terminal and run bundle install. As you can see, Bundler grabbed RSpec Rails as well as all of its nested dependencies. If we flip back over to the GitHub repository page, we can scroll down a little bit and see the next set of installation instructions. Here we need to run the rails generate rspec colon install command. So we'll paste that into the terminal now. As you can see, that installed a few more files required by RSpec into our application. With RSpec installed, we can now run our test suite. To do so in RSpec, you type the command RSpec spec. In our case, we don't have any example tests created yet, so we have zero examples and zero failures. Let's go ahead and create a test now. The RSpec Rails gem also comes with a series of generators. So if you generate a model, controller, or even an entire scaffold, RSpec will generate the appropriate tests for that model or controller as well. If you need to generate a spec after the fact, like in our case, you can just run the Rails generate RSpec colon model or colon controller, whatever type of test you need, and then you're gonna pass in the name of the spec. In our case, it's going to be user, since we're gonna be creating a user model spec. So you can see that created one file for us. Note the placement. This file is placed into spec models, and then the naming convention here is always the model name underscore spec dot rb. Let's go ahead and check that file out real quickly. In our application under spec models user, here you can see the code that RSpec generated for us. The first line here just requires the Rails helper. This is an RSpec file automatically generated at time of RSpec install. You can see it just below our user spec in our spec folder. Next, you can see our describe block. RSpec.describe user, the exact spelling of our user model. It's gonna be of type model in this case. As of now, we just have a pending spec. So let's flip back over to the terminal and run this to see what happens. Again, we can run RSpec spec to run the entire test suite, or we can refine following that same path structure. Looking at our code, you can see this is in the spec models user spec folder. So we could just add a slash models to run everything in the models folder, or we could refine specifically to our user spec. 
Since we only have one spec, that won't make any difference for now, but let's just use the very specific user spec. Now you can see different output. Here we actually have one example. We have zero failures, but one pending. Let's go ahead and open our user model to see the method we'd like to test. In app models user, you can see we have a simple full name method. This method just simply concatenates the first name with a space, then the last name, and returns this value as a string. So let's go ahead and write a test for this. Here in our user spec, we can go ahead and delete this pending line. Inside of our describe block, we're gonna go ahead and add the it block. You can have several it blocks in your describe. These are going to be our examples. So we're gonna fill in this string with what we'd like the test to accomplish. The idea here is to try and make this human readable. So it returns the full name for a user. You can see how that kind of reads in a way that may make sense to a non-technical user. The first thing we need to do here is create a user that we can test this full name method on. So here we're going to set our user equal to a user.create. Then we're gonna pass in a first name and last name. In this case, we're going to pass in Bear's cousin, Chipper. He's the goodest boy. Now that we've set up our test user in the user variable, we're gonna go ahead and create an expectation. Here, we're going to pass in our newly created user and then call our full name method. We will expect the result of this to equal the full name plus a space plus Chipper's last name. It's important to note here that while you do see me creating a user in this spec, this will not create a user in our development or production database. This is all scoped to the test database. So let's flip back over to the console and rerun our spec. Here you can see one example with zero failures. Each example will add a dot. For the sake of understanding what a failure looks like, let's go ahead and break this test real quick. If we instead expected a completely different last name, flipped back over to the terminal and reran our spec, you can see how a failure would present. Here we expected the user full name to equal Chipper Smith, our expectation, and what we actually received are included below. You can also see that since we called the EQ method, we are comparing these two values using an equal to operator or an equal equal. Then below you can see one example with one failure, as well as the command to rerun this specific spec. So if we flip back over to Sublime Text and undo our change, save and rerun our spec, you can see we have everything all green again. Well, that example shows what a spec looks like when it fails, in practice, that's not typically how you'd get a failure. Typically, you'd be working on some code, in this case, our full name method, and maybe we decide we want to flip this around so it's last name, comma, first. Cut the first name, place the comma in a space, and then paste back in that first name. If we flip back over to our terminal and run the specs again, you can see the failure again. Now, in this case, it's kind of trivial. All this really affects is the way the name would be printed out. So at this point, if you decided, oh yeah, I do in fact want to make this change, then you can go ahead and update your spec to account for your new expectation where it would be last name and then a comma and a space and then the first name. In this case, we just realized we've made a mistake as a result of this failed spec. So we flip back over and we undo our code back to the original full name method. Then we flip over to the terminal after saving that file, of course, and we run our spec, you can see it's green again. That's a slightly more realistic example of how you may break a spec. Now that we've confirmed our spec is passing, let's go ahead and commit this to our remote repository, GitHub. We'll do this with git checkout-b for branch. We're gonna call our branch our spec install. We really should have done this at the beginning of our feature creation. Unfortunately, I forgot, so we're just catching back up now. Here we can run git status to see the files changed. Once we've confirmed all those files want to be committed as part of this push, we'll run get add dot. We can run get status again to confirm all of our changes are staged for commit. Then we'll run get commit dash m to include a message, passing in our spec install. Next, we can run get push to push this new branch up to GitHub, our remote repository. 
At this point, I would typically recommend that you create a pull request and have your coworker review your code if you work on a team. In our case, Bear is uh, busy right now, so we're going to go ahead and skip the code review and merge our code. To do so, we're going to go ahead and check out our main branch with get checkout master. Then we will run get merge and the name of our branch, our spec install to merge our feature branch into our main branch. Finally, we will run get push to push this new merged branch up to GitHub. Typically at this point is when I would walk through a deployment, but in this case, this gem isn't added to production and the tests are currently only ever run on our local machine. So there's not really any point to do so. This was just a very brief introduction into RSpec, how to install, and then creating one very specific type of spec, a model spec. I hope to include more tests in the future, but please let me know in the comment section below if you found this helpful. And if you did, if you'd consider sharing with a friend who you think may be interested in this type of content, I'd really appreciate it. As always, if you have any questions, please include them in the comment section below. And with that, I'll catch you in the next AWS Rails tutorial.